Thank you, everybody. So um, I want to talk about how software development is not about software. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that software is what we actually produce. What we produce is business solutions. We help people solve their problems. And software is a cost we carry around. So the less software we can write, the better it is for the performance of the business that we're actually trying to help, as long as what we do actually has the same outcome. So I don't have to introduce myself anymore because that has been done great. I just love business software to a very unhealthy degree so that I even found my own conference in Berlin, but you get that slide later in the presentation. So software is everywhere nowadays. Everything we build has more and more software in it. The whole world becomes automated and software is in the cars we drive. Even in the older ones, there's software that regulates some systems and nowadays we have even self-driving cars. Software within any kind of um, air travels or in any other kind of travel that we do Think about how many software systems are inside a plane, and then think about how software teams usually operate. It's a wonder that they are actually safe. I mean, it's not a wonder there's a system behind that, but uh, it's like if you think about deadlines and we have to crunch the code, and oh yeah, it has just been tested, yeah, well enough, okay, all the unit tests pass, great. There are thousands of systems that could fail, but luckily the whole system in itself is safe enough. Software is in any kind of infrastructure of our cities. Anything that is operated in such a large million people city, I don't know, it's Denver a million people? Yeah, cool, great. So any kind of city like this size needs a lot of software systems to actually um, be organized well so that everybody is provided with water and electricity and stuff like that. But it's also in our homes. We talk to our houses nowadays. We say, hey, Google, do stuff. Sorry if anybody has a phone now that's beaming. But um, you say, hey, Alexa, hey, Google, and then they just do stuff for you. They answer questions, they play music, they turn on the lights. So this software is better be good. It better works well, because otherwise your house has a problem, and therefore you. It's also in small businesses. Anything that we do in business, nobody wants to do their, their calculations by hand or just type everything in Excel. You use software for everything, ERP systems and then uh, whatever kind of business you have. So um, up until the connectivity that connects all the people, communication software like Facebook, Twitter, tools like that that um, connect everyone on the world so that you can take your phone out of your pocket and you can speak to anyone at any time. All these things depend on software. So our role is very, very important. We came to an age where you unplug your cigarette to load your book. <coughs> so everything becomes software. And the problem is software becomes what the developers understood, not what the business people meant. So if you talk to business people and they tell you exactly what they mean, how often do you understand them correctly the very first time? I think almost 0%, you have to go through a lot of talking with them, you have to go through modeling and remodeling, and usually that iteration happens, I say usually in the non-agile world, it happens after stuff fails, and that's very bad because it's very costly. So we want to optimize this kind of communication. I think the three pillars of domain-driven design and of good business software is communication, empathy, and the ability to learn. It's not technology, it's not methodology, it's not even event storming, though I love it, but these three very abstract concepts, the ability to communicate is core to building good software. You need to be able to talk to business people, they need to be able to talk to you, so there needs to be a mutual understanding and a professionalization of communication on both ends. Empathy is very important because it doesn't matter how well we communicate. If you just tell me what you want, I say I understand you very well, and then I build what you want, but it's not really what you needed because I didn't have the empathy. I couldn't really feel how are you emotionally tied to this thing. Um, are we on the same page here? Am I really helping you or am I just fulfilling whatever you told me that you actually wanted? And the ability to learn, this is the hardest thing, I think, even if empathy is already pretty hard, but the ability to learn is very hard to master. Learning is not just getting information into your head. It's not just taking a class, going to a conference or writing some code and then practicing. Learning is also transference of learning. You don't want to learn as a person, you want to learn as a team or as a company. So how do you learn as a company? If I learn something and I give the information to the next person, then they have the written knowledge. But I'm able to build stuff now. Are they able just because I told them how to do it? The transference of learning is really hard. And I think if you master these three pillars of, uh, of software development, then you get a very high quality. And these are the things that you should always focus on with every method that you start with, every tool that you use. They should serve one of those purposes. So one of the easiest things to do, uh, the easiest things to do is structure your company aligned to your business needs. Does it ring a bell with any domain-driven design pattern here? Hmm? Conway's Law? Yeah, Conway's Law, great. So we have Melvin Conway. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs that mimic those systems, the communication structure of those systems. 
And this has an impact in both directions. So if my team is very hierarchical, I will not build a distributed system with a lot of negotiation happening in between because my mindset, my communication mindset is very hierarchical. I'm doing a trivial example here because complex examples take way more time to explain. If you're a very distributed team, if you're building Linux software, your software will not be a centralized server and then clients that depend on command and control because your communication structure is different. These are very trivial examples, but every company has a lot of different teams, a lot of different concerns, and they have social structures, they have hierarchies, they have dependencies on each other, and this communication structure should be represented in the system that you're actually building so that there's a two-way influence. If you want to change your team structure, you can actually push the technology in that direction, or if you want to influence the technology, you can push your team structure so, it mimics the, technolo so the technology mimics it afterwards. So this is discovering bounded context. Let's say our new company, Beamazon, it's a competitor for, for one of the world's largest uh, online shops. We start small, we start with a four bounded context. We talk to the business experts and they told us, yeah, we have shopping and payment systems and we need to deliver stuff and there's also a warehouse and all those systems have software. Great. So now we have four different bounded contexts that we kind of discovered in the first talk. And um, where do we put our effort in now? How do we start building this system? Do we start building the infrastructure layer or the database or do we start building domain behavior for one of those? It's really hard to determine where to start, so you, what you want to do is you want to find boundaries that enable your business to optimize its core domains. Every model that you come up with in the beginning, every kind of core domain or supporting domain or whatever, when you just start with names and say these are my domains, it's probably wrong. It's most guaranteed wrong. What you want to do is you want to go through an exploration phase to figure out, oh, where is the actual business value? Where do we distinguish ourselves from the rest of the market? What is our core business that we, that we want to excel in? And in Beamazon we said, hey, it's shopping. The whole advertisement, if you bought this, you might also be interested in this. This is what makes us different from the rest of the market. <clears throat> Nobody ever heard of Amazon, right? So um, this is where we want to excel, our core domain. And the warehouse, it needs to be able, if I say, okay, shopping cart has been ordered, great, with these products, the warehouse needs to be able to fulfill that shipment, to, to pack the stuff together and to send it away. So it's a supporting domain, it's specifically tied to our domain, but it's not our core business. So we want to focus our development on the core in the beginning. This is where we put all the brain power in, where we do the deep modeling, where we do the event storming and all that stuff. But then we also have payment, and payment is a very generic concern here. Payment, in most companies you can do payment just by getting PayPal or any kind of credit card or payment company do that for you, because it's a very generic problem. Everybody has the same problem. And then we have our core domain shopping and we have our supporting domain. But how do they interact now? When we build a system, we, we modeled how the teams should be structured maybe. We said, okay, this is core, this is supporting. But how do you build the system now? Well, the thing is, the core domain is upstream and the warehouse is downstream. It doesn't mean message flow or method call direction, anything like that. It's a model dominance. The model of the shopping car, of the shopping, is way more important. If the shopping people say, we change our model, shopping cart has been ordered, is now, it's now a different event, or it's, it's a, we need a REST API that does this and this and this, then the warehouse people need to adapt because they are the supporting domain for the core domain of the shopping system. If warehouse says, oh, we want to optimize a warehouse and we can't take your orders in this way anymore, please change, warehouse says, no, no, sorry, we, we, are, we are the core domain here, we define what goes and what doesn't go. Sometimes the supporting domains, the downstream domains have leverage. It's when you have like a customer supplier relationship. And then you can say, we need this. Could you put this in by next year maybe? And then you can, can uh, negotiate about that. But the core domain is always what drives your business forward. And the supporting domains should support the core domain. Making a map like this is very important because now you don't have a lot of frustration in your team. Usually when I'm in a team and I want to change stuff, but the other team is always hindering me, I get kind of frustrated. But if I understand that I'm there to support them, my job is still very important. I do not feel like a second-class citizen. This thing has to, build, has to be built also. But I understand why we do not change when I ever I want to change. So what we can do is, um, because warehouse, you know, it's a, it's a standard domain. It's a pretty solid domain. We don't want to get changed because those hippies in shopping always change their interface. So we build an anti-corruption layer, and then they can change whatever they want. The anti-corruption layer is doing the translation for us. It's a small piece of software that sits between the shopping and the, and the warehouse. So now we don't have to adapt whenever they change. We can just say, this is how we want to be called, and we're done. And then we figured out delivery, and shopping is kind of a pair mechanism. There's the, the communication between both um, 
contexts, they only succeed together or fail together. But then delivery is not really a core domain. How could they be pair? Yeah, well, it's a supporting domain, probably, but whenever shopping changes, the delivery needs to change immediately, so they need to talk together. And when delivery says, oh, we, we can't deliver this way anymore, UPS doesn't have this kind of car anymore, whatever, shopping now needs to be aware of that, that they advertise differently. So those fail together or succeed together, by my pseudo-analysis here, don't take this for a real market, um, <laughs> taking it for simplicity, but if you have a map like that, if you see, oh, this is upstream, downstream, the, the, you can specify the nature of relationship, of course, um, if you say this is pairwise, and now we know the core and supporting domains, then you can align your business very closely to your code base or to your technology. Even so far that the mapping becomes zero. If you do this very well, the exact needs of the business can be represented in any technical structure you have, and therefore you have a very low friction in translation between business and technology. So how do we find good bounded context? We can drive our bounded context exploration, co-evolved by feedback from vision, for example. Shopping has been our core domain, but in the future, when shopping is kind of like we, we explored it enough, it's working, now we want to have automated warehouses that fly with drones and have tanks on the sea and whatever. We want to optimize all those things, you know? Beamazon wants to be able to deliver in an hour whatever you order wherever in the world. Want to have cool, fresh ice in the desert? No problem, we fly it in. So now the warehouse and the delivery become core domain. So this can change over time. Every context map is only a moment in time. And to have the status quo and to have the status where you want to go, changing vision, you can plan ahead how do we get from here to there and what obstacles are in the way, how, how do we have to suffer through that. So, but also the product. If the product changes its place in the market, if, if market forces change, if export location changes, if you have certain experts that stand in this corner and talk about, oh, you know, whenever we sell this, and other people stand here and say, no, no, whenever this fails, we need to do stuff B and C. And you see, oh, those are different departments. It's a good indicator for a bounded context. But also, in the end, it's code. Code and the, the rules of the domain itself. If programmers can't fit a bounded context in their head, if a team can't really put it into the mental state, then it's too big for a bounded context. So even if it makes sense from a business perspective, if the whole shopping thing is like pages and pages and pages and many books of knowledge, then it's more than one bounded context because the developers can never think about the whole context in itself. And then we have to split them up. So in the end, we have one team per bounded context because we want to align our business and our technology. And if we have two different teams that work separately on the same model, it's prone to fail. It can't work. I can't change my model while another person is also changing my model without being in my team and we don't communicate. This is not working. doesn't mean that there has to be one team for every bounded context. There could be one team that does multiple bounded contexts, of course, but every bounded context can only be dealt with by one team. And then you have a team, you see the nice smiling faces here, it's business people in yellow and technical people in blue, and the documentation they have um, and they, the communication they share and even the defined relationship between multiple teams with a certain translation layer if, if you need it. And it doesn't have to be technology, it could also be just human communication that you model there. So you model your whole business and align your teams according to your business needs. But this leads to a problem. If you have your team and your team is distributed, for example, who, who here works in a distributed team? Oh, that's a lot of people. Great. So now I want to hear your negative feedback afterwards. Um, I say when you work in a distributed team, it's really, really hard to communicate well. It's not impossible, but it takes a lot more effort to have the same level of communication. And it's almost impossible to get the same level of trust if you don't have high, highly capable and communica communication capable individuals already that learn ways to work around those um, inhibitions. Thomas Allen said if there's more than 10 meters, I know it's not a US measure, but it's 30 feet, I think, or something. So the size of a school bus, um, if you have more than this distance between people, communication drops a lot. So if I'm saying something, and she's, she's smiling and nodding, but he's making a snarky, hmm, okay. <laughs> this is communication. The, the most, the highest percentage of communication doesn't happen in verbal form, but in paraverbal and nonverbal form. When we talk to business people, specifically business people, who are not in our Slack channel, Git commits, whatever, People just, they just want to talk to us in emails or whatever. When I talk to them and they seem very irritated or they seem angry or they seem anxious or they seem happy or different things I say make different movements in their faces happen, that's how communication and empathy work together and this doesn't work when they are far away. 
So even in a different, in a next room, I talk, people in the next room hear that and they're like, <laughs> and I know, oh yeah, that's, you know, we have a small communication even by passing by the room, sharing the water cooler, but this doesn't happen, happen in remote teams. So it's not impossible, but it's, it's very beneficial to be co-located in a bounded context team. And emotional safety, there was a big study by Google of which teams performed the best, and it weren't those with the most experts or with the highest degrees or with a certain distribution of talents. It were those teams that had the highest emotional safety, where people felt safe to talk about their, their problems, say, I can't do this, I, I don't know how, and I'm not sure here, can you help me out? If there's an internal trust that even if we disagree, we will not hurt each other, we just disagree about something professionally, and there's emotional safety within, uh, between us, those are the teams that perform the best. And this happens when you co-locate with people, when you have human interaction. And um, if you don't have emotional safety, there are two major problems that occur, abstract problems. The one is silence happens, and the other one is violence. And I don't mean gun violence or people actually punching each other. There's, a l there's even um, just emotional violence that has a very damaging effect. So in, if silence happens, people withdraw themselves. I don't take part in the discussion anymore. I sit in the back and say, yeah, well, that's withdrawal. So I'm not helping the team. I, I understand there's a problem, but I'm not talking about it. I avoid conflict. People say, but let's do it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. If, if you want to fight, you're right. So I just avoid because I'm, I'm kind of like in the down area here, and I don't want to get into that. I, I withdraw myself and get silent. And then I always mask my errors. So when I'm in the silence withdrawal phase um, and I make a mistake, I try to just hide it. I just try to mask myself behind the team. You know, the team did this whole thing. Great, it's not my fault. Cool. So, and then other people turn to violence when communication and safety isn't given. So they start controlling people. You know, please do this, you do that. Gives me status, I feel good about this. So I don't care about the status of the team anymore. I don't care about the success of how we as a team go forward. I want myself to be better than the rest. I want to feel good. So I'm controlling people. I'm, I'm, I'm labeling them. You know, she's a database girl. So database girl, come fix a database. Great. I do this five times and she starts to believe that she's a database person. So because she's better at databases. I label people and I make them do stuff by, by putting them in those roles. And when something happens, something bad with a database, guess whose fault it was? Yeah. And then in the end, even attacks can happen so that people actually start blaming other people. And if, if you go into open attack mode, if you actually say, but it's his fault and point fingers, that's when your company culture is completely derailing usually and you don't want to go there ever. You want to you wanna repair the system before that. So the whole company needs to care about emotional safety a lot. And weirdly enough, domain-driven design has a small tool for that. When you communicate between business people and technical people and the code, there's usually a big translation happening. So business people tell me, oh yeah, this law is changing, so the delivery rate goes up if you order this amount, blah, 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 whatever. And then I look into the code and it's like, okay, for I to X do cloud service native Docker, okay, great. It's not what the code says. So there's a huge mapping and my brain is always compiling and therefore you have this power level because business people know developers don't understand anything, right? And developers know business people don't really understand technology, but that's not the point. If you get the mapping more narrow, if the code gets more expressive in business language, then the communication becomes better and better and better. How is this tool called? Yay, the ubiquitous language. So the domain-driven design tool of ubiquitous language makes the mapping almost be zero. If you write your code very well, you can read it out loud as a business story. And then when business people tell you something changes, you look into the code, you see the change, you adapt it, you rewrite your tests, you're done. And business people learn to trust you. The emotional safety comes with experience there because they realize whenever you give them code documents, oh, this reads like my business story. So they understand that you care about the business and not about the next React framework anymore. You can also care about that, but the business people will realize that you put the business first. So I brought a good example for a ubiquitous language here. <laughs> Who has written code like that? The rest is lying. Okay, good. <laughs> or maybe functional programmers, that can also be. So. <clears throat> hmm? Yeah. Yeah, the multi butt supporter is my favorite. So, um, there are a lot of weasel words in that code. Delegate, supporter, all those technical patterns, and they don't need to be in there. It's a Shakespeare quote, you know, leaving a, a weasel leaves an empty egg, 
and the shell is not worth anything anymore. Those words don't carry meaning from a business perspective. And you might not be able to read those, so I'm going to read some of them for you. You have from the categories of, of the party heads, you have the my and I prequels to your class names. You know, my customer, a customer. That doesn't add any meaning. It, it always, only confuses you. You have the Hungarian notation. You know, this is a double age or an int age or something. We have IDEs that provide that for us. And you even have philosophy, like meta, infrastructure, layer. Those don't add value from a business perspective. They just describe what the thing is technically. But then you also have simplicity. This is a basic customer. And this is the advanced customer. Basic for whom? Things that I find very basic, he finds very complicated. So there's no real description here from the business perspective. And this goes through the pattern worlds. I see so many object classes and, and functions that have pattern names uh, ingrained in it. Customer repository or uh, something, something DTO, something, something, whatever infrastructure. Even the domain-driven design things, repository, aggregate, and co. I don't add them to the class names because they don't add meaning. If I want to know it's an aggregate, I can look into the implementation. I see it's an aggregate, that's great, but why should it be in the class name? So every time I use the class, it tells me a little bit of business and then aggregate. Oh yeah, great, this is an aggregate, nice. Good to know when I read a business story. Sarcasm. So um, this is just a small group of words and you can get them on the slides later in detail. And this is in no way limited. There are so many things I see, so many weasel words in code that don't add business meaning. If you go and dis delete every word in your code that is not business code, you get a very, very different shape of how your code is structured. So let's get rid of all the weasel words. And now we have better code, right? Trick question. No, we don't. So we got rid of the weasel words, but we still have a problem. Those things don't really have meaning for us. I mean, I kind of get like what a privacy manager does, but the multi-but, ah, something broke there. <laughs> it changed its function. And now we have, we have the problem that supporter, <laughs> the supporter pattern and the supporter word in our domain, dang, it's the same word, but in a different context, right? So in our business code, when I read supporter, this is what I mean, it supports something, but in the technical code, supporter is a pattern. So mm, I, wanted my, I want my abstraction layers to reflect that. My business code shouldn't read like that. My business code should read like this. I want to read, okay, sofa, picture, glass. These are the words I want to get at. So let's make the, let's make the praxis here. It's a very trivial example again. Real code looks more complicated in the end. But I have my customer repository and I say get customer by year of birth and I give it a year of birth. What could we improve? Repository. repository. Okay, get rid of that. What else? The goal is to have it more domain-driven. What's not domain-driven here? Daytime. Daytime, very good. So we should have our own value type, right? Year. Some would say give it an int, right? But minus 30 through 7 is not a year in our domain. So year should be a value type. And it's also type safe afterwards. You can't enter 5 meters in 1700. It doesn't work. So yeah. What else? By year of birth is redundant, so that could go away. So get customer by and then year of birth. Do people speak like that? Do I say customers get by year of birth? If I don't use software? I have an idea. Let's use language. Let's use the actual language that people use when they talk. So instead of customer repository, which just represents a data access layer to my customers, let's call it customers. Instead of a getter and buy whatever field, let's call it born in. Customers born in a year, that's exactly how you want to use it if you speak out loud. So to see the usage, this is why we do it. Instead of saying customer repository, get by year of birth, new date time, something, something, a lot of numbers, you say turning 50 is all customers born in year dot of 1986, uh, 68. Eric Evans had a trick in his book, it said model out loud, and I do this always when I type my code. After I'm done with my classes, I write, I read out loud. And if you read it out loud and it sounds weird, then it's probably not a good code, not a good model. And this helps. So um, this is how you build a value type in a very trivial uh, implementation. It's a struct, it's mutable, um, you have a field internally, just store the int of the year, but you don't give it a public constructor. You can do it, it's always a trade-off, right? But what I did here is I have a function called year off, and off just gets an int and it does a checks, is it in the boundaries, great, and then it either constructs a valid object or it doesn't construct at all. 
Therefore, every function that always gets a year can be sure. It's never null, it's never in a legal state, it's always a legal representation of the domain value, and it's type safe. And it looks good when you use it. Happy times. Okay, so this is how it looks if you do this for a few years. What? That's German code. <laughs> the thing about ubiquitous languages is they are ubiquitous languages in a certain context. So I work in a German hospital environment. Why would I use English code? My domain is German. That's great because if I am in my code and I see English and German mixed, now I know my abstractions layers are mixing. My technical command handles, for example, they translate from technical stuff to the domain. So I see both languages mixing, that's fine. But if I'm in the domain, I see that, I'm, oh, whoa, whoa, this is an English word, that doesn't belong here. So you don't have to understand this, you just admire how beautiful it looks. It's German language. <laughs> it just flows off the tongue. Okay, the trick is to have one ubiquitous language per bounded context, as I said. In shopping cart, uh, in the shopping system, there's a customer, right? And you also have a customer in payment, and you have a customer in delivery, and as customer and everything. So you would not build one customer class and use it everywhere. You would build four different customer classes because they have different changes, uh, rates of changes. But then you realize in shopping, there's not really a customer. It's basically people having interest in other stuff. So you need a different name for that. In payment, there's no customer. There's a creditor and a debitor. Oh my gosh, we're using the, losing the customer here. And in warehouse and delivery, you don't need a customer at all. You have a delivery address and warehouse doesn't care about it. They, they just get orders. The only thing you need is a class called customer that has an ID internally because you want to reference the customer type safe. So, ubiquitous language per bounded context. Now you can change the words how you want to. You can keep the word customer in your domain or you can change it. The others are not affected because in the translation between both contexts, you have a translation. Teams talk to each other and they realize, okay, we need different words here. Let's figure out if I say order for this customer, it's a creditor that needs to pay or a debitor. Or I have no clue about finance, obviously. But then you translate um, in, that, in that layer when you go over there. So you just discovered domain-driven design, emergent from whatever we talked about. You have teams in your bounded context. You have technical people and business people. They talk to each other and using documentation, either written documentation by business people or even code documents, and they all share the same language. So having a team that is inside a bounded context aligned with the business needs, sharing one specific language and having translation between those, that's what domain-driven design is all about in the core of it. The goal of DDD was to tackle complexity in the heart of software. So how to tackle it? They gave a lot of, uh, they, they, Eric Evans, um, so Eric Evans and the community and other book authors gave a lot of tactical patterns how to actually build better software in more domain-driven fashion. You have patterns like value objects, entities, and stuff like that, and even architectures like messaging architecture, CQRS, and stuff like that. But this is not domain-driven design. These are just tools that help you to be more expressive in your, in your language, in your ubiquitous language, when you build code. And that's what you want to get at. If you find other patterns that work better than value objects or aggregates, go use them. A lot of programmers start with, oh yeah, I've read the first seven chapters of the blue book, great, now I'm using all these patterns, I'm doing DDD well. No, you're not. Probably better than before without doing anything, but what you actually want to do is figure out, okay, what kind of architecture do I have here? What kind of problem do I have? If functional reactive programming with an event stream is more expressive in my domain than just have aggregates that do stuff, then use that. Any pattern that makes language more crystal clear is what you want to get at. So DDD, in my definition, is the three Ds, is discover what is, then dream what can be, and design what shall be. And this is a DDD whirlpool, kind of, by Eric Evans. Um, so discovery phase, and then the exploration phase, and then um, the design phase, and they all go in circles all the time. And this is where complexity theory comes in. So, when you say there's a lot of stuff in our domain, we have different contexts and where do we put our effort in, um, you need to be able to figure out, okay, what kind of complexity is my problem here? Is it, a, is it an obvious problem? Then, you know, the first thing you do is sense the beer is empty. You categorize lethal problem, for a German at least, and then the response is, hey, you, get more beer, put it in there. Ah, oh, problem averted. So, in those cases, you would not use the modeling strategical tools of domain-driven design. But you still have benefit if you use value types and stuff like that, if your language becomes more clear. But don't put too much effort in solving this thing because it's an obvious best practice thing that you can just go by the book. If you have a complicated scenario, too fast, if you have a complicated scenario, something where you need expertise, 
Like your car breaks down in the middle of the street. It's not an obvious problem. You need an expert. You need someone who understands cars and who has studied or experience. So then you can sense the problem. Oh yeah, this is blinking and this is beeping. Great. So you analyze it, what to do, and then you respond in, in, in the fashion with good practices. And it's not obvious. It's not there's only one best practice, but you choose from all the options because you're an expert. <clears throat> most domains we're actually working in are complex domains. At least most core domains are complex. Not all of them, but most of them. And complex means, given any amount of analysis, you cannot possibly get um, to the right answer in the first step. Because it's not an analytical problem, it's a complex um, interchanging problem. The fiscal system. Let's just change this one rule and it finally will work. No, it won't. If you change one thing, it changes a lot of different behaviors of all the players in the system and you can't predict the outcome. What you can do is you sense a problem and then you probe it. You make hypo uh, hypotheses, you go a scientific approach, figure out, hey, after the hypotheses, let's, let's do an experiment. After the experimentation phase, respond, change something, and then do the next probe. And what we're trying to do when we do good domain-driven design is get complex domains, complex parts of our domain, to be only complicated. We want to probe as long as we figure out, oh, now we have something that is structured, now we have good practices that we can approach here, and we got it into an easier way of solving this problem. And then there's also the chaotic world, you know, where demands change every day, where the market changes faster than you can think, where technology is changing so fast, you don't really know what to do, so you act. You just do something, you see what happens, and then you, you respond and change your behavior. Maybe you get out of the tar pit, maybe you burn, but in chaos, it's the only thing you can do is just act and see what happens. Well, there's a danger between if you're in an obvious domain and you are there very long and you think, oh, this is obvious, of course, and the market changes and people switch, some leave the company, some come in. At some point, obvious can fall over the cliff and become a chaotic environment without you even noticing. So it would be good to always be aware of my bounded context, in which state of the Kinevin complexity framework are we, so how do we actually behave in here? It's important so you do not misalign your actions with the problem at hand. So how to model business software? It's very simple. It's only three steps. And whenever someone tells you, I have a solution for you, it's very simple. It's only three steps. Don't believe a single word that person says. That being said, um, it's true because it's abstract. So we have three simple ways of dealing with business, uh, with uh, domain-driven design. What we want to do is we want to extract the right model to be able to help. I'm not saying how this works. I don't say there's a specific one solution, but this is just the abstract thing. You want to extract the model to be able to help. Then you want to put the model into semantic code so the code becomes expressive and the next person has a transfer of learning by reading this, just the story in business code. And then you want to secure that code from corruption. And even if I'm a German, this is a dance, not a march. You don't go three steps, you're done. It's like you do these three things, but whenever something occurs, when there's more learning happening, you can always go for more semantics. You get better at building DDD patterns, change your code. You realize you didn't learn everything, so go back to modeling, go back to extracting phase. You figured, yeah, the Hibernate framework is kind of like in the way now. We find better ways around that. So let's secure from corruption against technical implementations. Let's do this exercise. Step one. Now everybody has to be very sharp. We want to extract the right model. I brought two domain experts, and they're going to explain. They are going to explain their domain. <laughs> what question do we have? <coughs> yes. We need a glossary. Oh, great. As if I would have predicted that someone would say that. So we need a glossary. Let's just get a definition of all those words, right? Cool, then we can build our classes first. I would say no, because I chose this domain because it's so abstract, so, so weird, that we think, oh, we don't know what those words mean. In usual business, you don't know either, but you have a feeling you know those words because they are English words. Always treat the language of the business experts as if it would be an alien language. You don't know what they mean when they say words. If you get a glossary, the definition is also in their language, so it becomes really hard to keep up with 25,000 open strings of, oh, now I got it, I think. Um, there's a different question we can ask first. He said, or they said, because it's important. In their long story, there was something they were emphasizing. This is important, so go for that. Ask why it's important. Play the 5Y game. 
And then they give you a false reason. They say, because of fleep, has all of the fleep juice. That is not logic. That's not a reason. That's just a description. So you can always say, no, but what do you really want? You know, you can play with the five Y game as long as you want, but who here has children that play the five Y game all the day? <laughs> See? So if, if you ask why, 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 business people get annoyed very quickly and they don't believe that you have a brain between your ears. So what you can do is you can challenge those questions by asking alternatives. So could we use orange juice? Would that work? And then you can get the reaction from them. If they look like, what? <laughs> now you know that wasn't a smart idea, but you learned something. But if they like, huh, I, 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 mm -hmm, like, now you know they, they think about it. It might be possible, you don't know how, but you're learning by asking for alternatives. Then they give you a time frame. They say, first this happens, then this happens, and this happens. Always mix up the time. Thank you. Always mix up the time. Say, okay, what if this happens first? What if we first repurpose it and then the Shlomi shows up? And then again, they are like, you can't repurpose what hasn't been there. Yeah, great. I, I understand now. Or they say, yeah, it could happen. So if you say, what happens if this is the other way around? Always play the dumbest person in the room. You have no clue, right? You don't have to seem smart when you model with domain experts. You have to seem curious. They don't want to show you to be a show-off, like, yeah, oh, I understand your domain already, of course. No, they want you to actually dig into it and understand it. So ask the weirdest questions just to get a model, but whenever you feel that you annoy them, stop what you're doing at the moment. <clears throat> and then also an important part is all the qualifications. When, when people say, this is a bunch, this is later, this is uh, several or regular old. If they give you something binary, ask if it's a continuum, you know, it's black or white. Are there gray areas in between? If they say regular old, oh, is there an irregular old or a regular young? Or do you just mean standard? I mean, this, this could be just a phrase or this could mean something in the domain. And if you ask all those questions, you get a lot of understanding because they will not just give you an answer of, oh, this word means this. If you ask this weird kind of question, they'll give you a story. Whenever you hit a spot, they give you a story. And from those stories, you learn. But the final question we haven't asked yet is, what's the problem? We got a great domain. We got a great description. We ask a lot of things, but why are they here? Do they want to open a new market? Do they want to make their software faster? Why don't we start from this? We should start from this. This is the greatest question to start with. What is your actual problem? So I wasn't saying, go in this order. I asked, what would you ask? And it's always someone saying, we need a glossary. <laughs> oh, great. So um, trying to make the point here that this is the only important question. The others are metrics or heuristics that help you in diving deeper into the domain. But what the actual problem is, is what you want to get at. And software development is a learning process, and the working software is just a side effect. I blatantly stole that from Alberto, that quote. Um, so software is about learning about the business. And this learning takes time, and the bottleneck is in the learning, not in the coding. We're not slow programmers because we don't understand React yet, or because we type so slowly. We are slow because it's hard to understand what business people actually want and go through those iterations and, and meetings. Even just to get a hold of them is hard. So let's have a meeting. This is a bad communication situation, right? Who enjoys meetings like this? Good. <laughs> they do, yes, they do. So this is a bad situation because people are sitting. Sitting people are, the, the blood pressure gets lower and you get tired and you get, a, you know, you're not really engaged in stuff. I'm standing up here, I'm like, yay, let's do this. You're sitting there taking notes. So there's a different level of, of emotional involvement. And if you have like a four hour meeting, sitting, after two hours, everybody's just asleep. Nobody's actually listening anymore. People are Facebooking. This is a problem here. I'm sitting, I'm taking notes on my phone or Facebooking. Nobody really knows. And then there's a communication psychological problem. People opposing me, they are opposing me, right? I'm this side, you're that side, and my idea and your idea, and we're fighting. And the person next to me is my ally because I can whisper like, what an idiot. But the person behind that is opaque to me. I can't see them. I can't talk to them. So it's already predetermined who I model with and how, depending on the order of how I sit. What you want to do is you want to stand up, you want to move around, you don't want to have those obstacles like chairs or tables. If you, if you walk, approach a model on a, on a wall and you draw on the wall everybody shoulder to shoulder, allied against the model, that's what you want to get at. But only talking is also not helping because words vanish and you want to make them stick. If I say something and five minutes later you're like, ah, oh, but you said, and I'm like, no, that's not what I meant, and we're arguing about things that we said and meant, and this is so time-wasting. This is where event storming, my favorite modeling method, comes in. In event storming, you take the right people with a limited amount of time and an infinite modeling space with stickies and pens for everybody, and people just start modeling on the whole wall. 
I think there's an event storming workshop. Uh, there was one yesterday, and there might be other talks about that topic here, because I think this is one of the prevalent uh, modeling methods in DDD nowadays. So this method makes it possible to flesh out a great model with deep understanding and even a lot of active listening that is enforced in a few hours. Business people tell me something and they write it down. I tell them something, I write it down. We figure out it doesn't look the same. So we move stuff around and we talk about it all the time. There's no vanishing words. Someone else can come into the conversation later, look at the model and follow along because it's all written out. So this looks like this. If you have never done an event storming, this is how event stormings usually look. You have a few people standing in the back. That always happens. People who are not really willing to engage because they're insecure or they want to observe the whole thing or they, they just think for themselves before they write stuff. And you have people that are eager to go to the front and just storm and storm and storm. And this is super important to not force people into roles. If you do an event storming, it's whoever there is there on their own time. They, they, they need to be um, in their free will mode to be creative. And you as a facilitator only need to make sure that everybody's heard and that the model is challenged by all the people that are important. What you can see here is what we had in the beginning, the expert localization. You see the bounded context emerging usually pretty naturally. If you have business people in the room, they cuddle up in groups like, okay, this is the one part of the business, this is the other part. And in between you see some messaging or some decisions. So more often than not, you get your, your um, resulting context map just by looking at where people stand in an event storming. And then, after the event storming, you have a model with commands and decisions and events and, and information that come out of the whole system. But now we want to go to step two and put this into semantic code. So event storming helps us to extract the right model to be able to help. Because we ask questions, because we ask what's your problem and go into the important phases, we go through the narratives and the storytelling, we have a flow on the wall. But how do we get it into code? And when you take those sticky notes, commands, the blue ones, and the yellow ones as decisions, and the orange ones as events, and you extract them and put them into the CQRS and event sourcing architecture, then you can just, once the architecture is built, you can just extract the wall into code by typing what's on the paper. Order shopping cart is a command, and it's also a blue sticky note on the wall. And that's a decision. Is a product in stock? Yes, so shopping cart has been ordered. Otherwise, order has, de has been denied because product out of stock. Those things are on the wall, you type them in code, your code is done. Your domain grows and grows and grows with every modeling, but the actual coding part becomes the easy part. The hard part of domain-driven design and of building business software is modeling. Typing those classes into code later is very easy. <clears throat> so, you basically have your command side up there where commands come in and you have rules and policies. You can implement them as aggregates or functional reactive or in any way you like, but they do decisions based on state of the business and then they publish events. And those published events can populate or um, project into any kind of view that you want, into the read models that your applications actually query. And um, you also use the same events and event sourcing to populate, uh, to rehydrate your domain state again. Okay, so if anybody has questions for secrets and event sourcing, I'll be happy to answer them after the talk. Step three, secure the code from corruption. So now we have our code, we have our CQRS event sourcing model, we had the model before, and now there's this beautiful pattern called hexagonal architecture. I hate that word because it, it implies six sides and there are no six sides. You can have 20 sides in your hexagonal architecture. <laughs> um, programmers' brains always go like, but this is not hexagonal anymore. Don't, don't mind that. What we do here is, ports and adapters. The thing that we want to focus on is there is no layered architecture. You don't have UI, domain, uh, database. What you have is a domain is pure. It doesn't have any dependencies. The domain just is and it just behaves. But there's some technical layer that knows, oh, my REST call comes in, so now I need to re-instantiate those objects, call that function. And the resulting events I need to publish. Cool. Separation of concerns. Infrastructure, then infrastructure to domain translation, and then the domain itself. And you can have as many ports as you want, not only six, of course. So this is a simple graphic, and this is where most of the actual crunching and coding and a lot of the effort of the programmers lies. So I'm oversimplifying with this graphic, of course. But the message here is that the domain needs to be pure, because that's the actual value you're providing. You don't want your domain, your domain to change just because your infrastructure changes. Your messaging framework, your domain shouldn't care about that at all. So, but why Tsungaya would you put in all that effort? Again, software is what developers understand, not what business people mean. 
So we want to code harmony, in harmony with the business. I don't want my code to change for other reasons than business reasons, my domain code at least. I want to have high internal trust between business people and technical people. And I want them to believe that the code is actually doing what they believe it, uh, it should be doing. And I want to be safe from external influences. I don't care if some framework is changing stuff. My domain is always pure and safe. So I want to move away from reward and punishment and strive to engagement. There's autonomy in what I want to do and how I want to do it. And this is what motivates programmers a lot. A mastery in technical or in, in the business or in facilitating. Whatever your, your stick is, you can go there. In DDD, you get mastery, per, uh, mastery possibilities everywhere. And there's purpose, like, uh, this is what DDD is all about, you know. We solve a business problem, so yay. This is from a book from David Pink about motivation of people. And money is a very bad motivator. Those things motivate me working every day. But there's challenges. Beware of hierarchies in your domain. Um, if you have DDD from up top, people from the bottom will fight it. If you have it from the bottom, people in middle management or from the top will fight it. So it's really hard and it's not a problem that DDD itself solves, but so you need agile to actually get domain-driven design into your business. And don't try to be a perfectionist because that will frustrate you. If you try to get DDD perfect before you start, you will never start. Just start anywhere. Do, do event storming, do it wrong, it's not a problem. You get better, you learn. This continuous learning is what you want to do. You change code and culture and agile and architecture as programmers and you shape the world, so shape it good. Because we're out of time, these are some books, and I will not go through all of them right now, but these are books, take the slides, read all of them. You see that only three software books and the rest is about behavior patterns, psychology, and stuff like that, because that stuff is way more important in building business software than actual technology. And if you want to learn more, go to conferences like Kandinsky in Berlin, DD Europe in Amsterdam, Exchange in London, or go to any meetup or this conference, of course. Um, join the community. This is where you learn the, learn the most with experience and with um, exchanging with others. So now, goodbye, go forth, and have meaningful lives. So I think we're out of time for questions, but... If anybody wants to ask some, everybody who wants to leave can. I'm still here. There's a microphone, so just please go to the microphone and ask your question. Well, my, my voice kind of carries, so I don't know when I need it. Okay. Um, uh, I, we're working in a distributed team environment, yeah. so you know, this is kind of, I, I know everybody has this challenge uh, working in a distributed team environment. Yeah. Do you have any tips or ideas on how would you facilitate uh, event storming? Yeah, so the question is how would you facilitate event storming in distributed teams? And the answer sadly is you don't. Um, there's some ways around that. There's, uh, there's an online tool where you can do event storming in some kind of like a Trello board with a live chat. And that's better than doing nothing. But you will lose a lot of the benefits of the actual event storming because the actual learning happens when you stand next to people and move around and stuff like that. So this, these benefits, the big ones, you don't get in a, in a distributed modeling session. Depending on the size of the project, fly everybody in for a day, do an event storming, and then distribute again and work. This could be beneficial, but it's a trade-off, of course. Um, I don't know if Alberto has found a way yet, but the last thing I knew, and from everybody else who's experimenting with it, distributed event storming doesn't really work. I've tried VR event storming. I have a VR helmet, and you can move in virtual space. But the problem is that everybody needs a room and a VR headset, so that's not feasible at all. Um, at this time, we don't have a solution for that. Yes, please. Um, what benefit people get from distributed teams? Well, you're asking the wrong person because I'm propagating co-location all the time. Um, you get the benefit of your experts live everywhere in the world and they want to live there and you can hire them when they can work remote. So if you want to get Jessica working in your team, you better offer her a remote job probably. So. That's kind of the trade-off. Um, but other than that, please ask people who work remotely. They can give you better answers. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'll see you outside and have a beer tonight. Bye.